Hello, I'm Dave Riley. For this issue and the next issue, we're going to try something a little different. We're going to make a molding plane. Uh, a very useful tool, and we're going to go through the whole procedure, and when you're finished, you'll have a very nice tool to use. Making wooden planes is not a complex project at all. In fact, it's really very simple. Uh, here are some samples of the planes that I have made recently. This is a hollow bottom plane that I use for rounding over. It has a nice long bed similar to a jointing plane uh, to maintain things nice and flat. This is just a little block plane that I have made with a half inch blade. Very useful for getting down into narrow areas. These two planes are molding planes. This has a half inch round bottom, quarter inch radius. And then this has a three-quarter inch rounded bottom, a three-eighths inch radius. This plane is the one that we're going to feature in the construction, though you'll have drawings for both of these two planes. What I use for reference for making my wooden planes are three very, very good books. This uh, Wooden Planes and How to Make Them by Perch and Lee has articles of all the different types of planes. This Making Traditional Wooden Planes by John Whalen is also very good. Measure drawings, uh, you can just follow it exactly to make your planes. And then this book, The Hand Plane Book by Garrick Hack, uh, is a beautiful book, lovely illustrations, gives more history of all the different types of planes. Very good resources. All right, the first step is to prepare your stock. You can either do this from a solid block, uh, as I have here, or more conveniently for me is the built-up construction using two pieces glued together. The first step will be to produce this rabbited edge here. Uh, what I do is I will rough cut this out on the table saw, leaving about a 30 second uh, amount of waste. Then I can go to the jointer and finish a nice clean cut. This surface here has to be really straight and true because the side plate will be glued onto that when you're toward the end of this construction and you need a good smooth glue joint to do that. So we'll just take it over to the jointer now and make our cut. Now the next step is to do the rounding over with a, to put a 3 8 inch radius on the bottom as we have here on this one. We'll do the layout uh, using a template do it on both ends so that when you're doing the planing, you'll have a reference at both ends uh, to keep yourself honest on this. After you've established where the radius of the bottom is going to be, you still have to put in this bevel here at 20 degrees. So it's just a matter of laying it out from the edge of the circle, come up 20 degrees. I've already measured that angle make the line, and then at the point where it ends, draw that in, and where it ends at the bottom, you draw that in. That is your guide for the planing. You'll do the same thing at the other end. Now we set this up for the planing of this bevel using a metal plane, and we can start. This could be done on the table saw to rough out all of this, but I find the, the hand work with a plane very satisfying. Now the bevel has been completed and it's time to just start the rounding over of that three inch, three eighths radius curve here. In this area, this is going to be the one you're going to have to have some care with because you want this radius that you're making not only accurate, but nice and straight and true because after all this is the base of a plane and as you know the base has to be flat and true and this is no exception. This surface now not only has to be accurate in its roundness 
but it also has to be t straight and true. Uh, just as you would true up a, a new plane, after all, this is a plane, you have to have it nice and straight. So when we get down to that point, we'll use a straight edge to ensure that we are staying true, and then a radius gauge to be sure that we're using, getting the right radius formed. Just take your time, enjoy the physical activity to determine the correct radius of the uh, sole of this plane. I've made this simple little gauge, it's just a three-quarter inch hole drilled through a piece of three-quarter inch hard maple and then just cut away so I have this area here and now I can start and use it as my gauge. So I see here I'm a little high in the center, looking pretty good most of the way along. Now is the, the careful fitting time. All right. Be sure to check it all the way its full length. So that looks like it's going to be just about right. Now I want to check it to see that it is truly flat. I've just used a strip that is a straight edge and I see I'm right on. I'm really having a lucky day because sometimes it isn't. You have to play with it a little bit. So now I'm satisfied. I have my radius. It's just a matter of starting with the sandpaper to start the smoothing process. I just start with a coarse 100 grit, just fair all of those curves. You're not gonna change the shape very much unless you do a extensive amount of sanding. Go to a little finer, this is 120. I'm using a wooden block with a rubber pad. What are very nice are these shaped pieces, little rubber. And now they will ensure that you don't get any flat surfaces on it. They work just beautifully. And then we go to a final fine finish. And now that's all it takes to do it. Now that the uh, shape of the sole has been completed, this has been made considerably oversized. The correct length as you'll see in the drawings is for 10 inches. This one happens to be 14. I did this so that if you're doing any planing, any work, there's any chip out or any damage at either end, that's going to be cut away, as is the cover plate. When it's glued on, you'll trim the entire unit to length. So we'll just come in two inches from either end. And I will make my mark. Because you have to know the length because the mouth comes in and starts at approximately one third of the distance. This seems to be the, the standard setup so that the angle of the blade, it'll come back out up here. So this is the reason why you need this. Establish your final length, at least mark it at this point. Now we lay out the opening for the throat and the uh, mouth. It's approximately one third of the way back. And the drawings I have it called for is three and a quarter inches. So we just come back this three, <coughs> three and a quarter inches from here. This is, does not have to be extremely precise. 
this is a pretty open dimension. And then we, the next one will be at three and a half inches. Because this will be the opening of the, the mouth. Now setting the protractor at the correct angle, we just line up. It's very important now to take a look at the drawing and study it carefully. It'll be very easy, uh, if you're not paying attention, to get the 50 degree angle to the front and the 60 toward the back. So watch what you're doing and draw your line. If you notice on the drawing, there's approximately a quarter inch separation here. This allows space for the blade and the wedge. All right, the next thing to do is to saw out this mouth and throat. Uh, I'm using a dovetail saw, and as you see here, I put a, a stop here uh, set exactly to my three-eighths or three-quarters of an inch depth. It just makes life a little easier. You could lay out your depths and then watch very carefully uh, where you're ending up, but this way it's, it's very quick. Many years ago, I drilled two holes in the side of this blade, and I've put many different type of stops and guides on it. So it's just kind of a handy thing to do. Also, when you're making your cut, it's important that you keep your saw at a nice 90 degree angle. So again, my little gauge block turned out to be a nice little reference. I just hold it here while I'm getting started and periodically check my angle just to see that I'm staying true as to where I want to be. And then it's just a matter of saw until you get to this full depth, which is referenced from this surface right here. This could be done very well on a table saw. I would suggest you use a sled to hold the work so that you can clamp it down and that way you'll get nice, straight, finished cuts. But doing it by hand seems to be more appropriate for a hand tool. I'm now down to my stop. Let's see. All right, I'm completely bedded. It's nice and straight and parallel. We have our first cut completed. Step over to the second one. Again, checking it with our high-tech square. So now that we've cut out the, the uh, mouth and throat, it's time just to remove the waste. So since this is a wood carving sequence, I ha can't resist saying that what a relief it is to get back to the carving. Starting on one side, so that you avoid any chip out. Just a matter. This can be done just as well with your bench chisels or mortising chisels. Naturally, I'm going to prefer using the carving tools, but whatever it takes to get this out. It's the only thing you have to be concerned about. Now that I've roughed out the bulk of it, just from habit, I prefer to put it in a more wood carving position. It's just more comfortable for me. Whatever works for you, uh, as it is in a lot of these projects and the methods, what we show you isn't always the only way to do it. Sometimes you're more comfortable with a different tool or a slightly different sequence or process, and that's fine. Once I get almost up to the mouth, I'm going to quit and come back from the other side. There's always the possibility of, of chipping out when I break through, so there's no sense ruining something now that we're so far along. Although, like in every situation, if you should really spoil the mouth opening, it's very common to
cut that area away, small section out, and put in a new block, because this is exactly the way they repair old planes, by replacing the mouth that has been worn from all the years of chips sliding across it. So it's pretty hard to ha have this construction end up in the trash box. There's a lot of things you can do to make it work. Leaving the length oversized is uh, another uh, advantage of that is that now when I'm clamping there at the end, if I mar the wood, it makes no difference because that's going to be cut away. So that's another advantage in this, doing it this way. Final cleanup, I'm using a little, very narrow skew chisel just to get in there and refine some of that edge. If you don't get a nice smooth surface, that's not critical because there won't be anything here, but for aesthetics, you could go through here with a triangular or a square file and clean up this bottom surface. Uh, it'll just make you feel better, if anything else. So that completes cutting out the throat and the mouth. The next thing we're going to do is make the wedge and fit it in here before we cover over the side plate. Now the throat and the mouth have been completed. It's just a matter of fitting a wedge to hold in the uh, iron. Now I'm using the material that I will make the iron out of as my gauge. I check to see that my surface here is truly flat and the blade or iron will sit firmly on it. I make the wedge just out of the uh, same material. You can make this out of a contrasting wood as I have done on this plane, just purely decorative, but you do want a hard wood uh, to make it out of. I laid out my 10 degree angle, which is the angle between these two faces here, and I've made it very much oversized because if you have to do a lot of fitting, you may find that your it keeps working its way down further and further so that when you have the final shape, and the shape is up to you, but this is pretty much the traditional shape for the uh, wedge. Um, you can then, after it has been assembled, then you can set where all the shape and the head, sometimes called the finial, of the wedge is, so that it is clearly outside of the body. So we do that, set this in, put in our wedge material, And then I check to make sure it's not wiggling. And I can look to see that the iron lays flat in that groove. That's, that surface is important, as is this surface is important, so that the wedge fits firmly against that. So I see here I was lucky, almost on my first attempt, I have good contact over the entire length. So now I know that this will be where my wedge is going to be. I can then decide where I would like to have this, the decorative element here, perhaps like that. It's just a matter of tracing out and a bit of work on a bandsaw. And I'll have it. Remember that this surface here is where your mallet strikes to set the wedge in. So this has to be a fairly robust piece. You can't make this thing too thin or too small. Now that we have the wedge fitted, it's just a matter of cutting it to its final shape. This shape in here is strictly freehand. You just want to be sure that when the blade or the iron is fitted, this area from here to here is up above the body of the plane, but that the end of the uh, iron will extend up beyond it so that that's where you can strike it with a hammer. Simply a matter of cut it out, polish it up, and you have it done.
One caution is remember that this end here is where you strike it with a hammer to drive the wedge in tight. So this has to be a fairly substantial section in here uh, to withstand the blows. But other than that, it's pretty straightforward. And just a little bit of touch up at the belt sander. Just get the glue on, smear it around. Try not to get any more glue than you possibly can avoid in the uh, throat and around the mouth because it's going to have to be cleaned out so that you get a nice surface again. Now the object is just to glue it up nice and tight. I suggest you have enough clamps so that you can't see the project anymore and then that should be about enough. Let it sit for an hour, a couple of hours overnight then we can trim it to length This completes the woodworking aspect of building the plane. In the next issue, we're going to start working with the making a plane blade to fit in this. We'll learn the metalworking, the heat treating, and tuning of the plane. I'm Dave Riley for Woodworking at Home.